We've, we've done the biology and the ecology, so we, we kind of got an idea of what's going on here in the region, what the area was like. We talked about the natives, we had uh, the French, and we talked a little bit about waterborne. Uh, so now it's a, ch a chance to see who the, I, he, I was just here, uh, Washington was just here, him and guests were just here, they left a few minutes ago. So I told them to hang around. So we're gonna talk about, uh, a Wilderness Explored, 1749-1753, the British Colonial Strategy and the Washington Gist Expedition. And Brady Kreiser is our uh, presenter. Mr. Kreiser is the author, author of five books studying empire and imperialism in North America and is the host of a cable television series, Battlefield, Pennsylvania, which is on PCN. He's the winner of the Donald S. Kelly and Donald, Donna J. McKee Awards for Outstanding Scholarship and Service in the Fields of History. His newest book, War in the Peaceful Kingdom, The Catanning Raid of 1756, is due for publication this fall from West Holm Publishing. Brady has served on the faculties at Robert Morris University and Southern New Hampshire University, and he will be signing books later, so after he gets through talking and you're so excited, you wanna run over there and he'll get you a book too. So he's written about Gaia Suda, which is the one that I'm into uh, because of Gaia Suda being so close to here. So uh, Brady Kritzer. Kreiser, I'm sorry. Okay, can everybody hear okay? Um, I'm very impressed by the turnout today. I think that's a testament to the strength of history in this region. Uh, when I first saw the turnout, I thought Donald Trump was in town, but unfortunately it's just me, so uh, I apologize in advance. Um, I'm really excited to be here. A lot of people can't understand that. When I first drove through this area last year, believe it or not, in Cochranton, it's the first time I'd ever really had a chance to see French Creek. Now, if you understand the history of, of this creek, you know that's a really big deal. I stopped on a bridge and there was a truck driver behind me who like laid on the horn, like what is this guy doing, you know? But when I see this, this creek, I just can't help but think about the, the enormity of the events that happened here, the, the footprint of empires that occurred here, it's really special. Uh, events like this are what I call the front lines of history in this field. You know, if you study the American Civil War, you know that something like two books a week are released in that field. Uh, but when you study the French and Indian War, you might be lucky to get two or three books a year sometimes. So events like this, uh, are really the front lines of this history. And we have some really great historians today for you. Um, and I hope I can live up to that expectation. Uh, I personally uh, am a historian of empire. I study uh, why empires do what they do, how they rise, why they fall. And my specific professional uh, endeavor has always been empire in North America. And I'd like to give you some imperial statistics and some things to think about uh, that we can kind of deal with as we move on and focus specifically on the British side of this story. Um, I think empires are at their best when they compete. And I want you to think about that. Think about the last great imperial competition that the world had. I think it's the Cold War. What did we do as a country when we were competing with a rival empire? We went to the moon for crying out loud. Today we can't even fix a bridge. <laughs> and that has a lot to do with being you know, the, the, the only person at the top. So I think empires can bring the best out of each other. I think by their nature when they compete, they push the boundaries. Uh, and that's what's gonna happen here. And believe it or not, French Creek is in a lot of ways a super highway between the great superpowers of the planet, Britain and France in the 18th century. So think about this. Um, by the time that the British colonies in North America reached the Appalachian Mountains, the French colonies in North America have reached the Rocky Mountains, at least in some way, shape, or form. That doesn't sound very competitive to me, uh, but it is, and we'll talk about why. Uh, by the time you get to the 1750s, there are a million and a half British people living in North America. Uh, in Canada, the French, have 55,000. So that doesn't sound very competitive either. When you think about what the French did on this creek in 1753 and 1754, uh, building forts and bringing in troops, 
They brought about 2,600 troops. That's a major investment. It doesn't sound like a lot, but 2,600 is almost 5% of their total population in Canada at that point. That's the equivalent today of the United States putting the entire population of Florida in a foreign country. Think about that, about, about 4.5% of our total population. So these might not sound impressive by today's standards, but by 18th century standards, this is enormous. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Um, one of the things I want to deal with, with with the English before we get to what they did here is a very kind of quick run through of what it meant to be British uh, in the colonies in the 18th century. Because I think we tend to make that pretty simple. And I actually think there's a lot of parallels we can still draw from colonial America today. Um, we tend to think of colonial America as a very homogenous place. That is, you have, a, in the popular sense, a lot of powdered wigs, a lot of you know, red coats and wagons and farming and things like that. And that's all true, but to me, when I study colonial America, I think colonial America is a very stratified and nuanced place uh, that's actually pretty diverse. And that's going to play a lot into what happens in the 1750s. We all know the story as kids. We have 13 colonies. Um, that's if you count what's in North America. That's ignoring the 13 colonies that are also in the Caribbean. Uh, but when you look at the 13 colonies, again, one thing I want to impress upon you is that they actually are very different. Even though they fly the same flag, even though they largely speak the same language, that is English. Uh, not to ruin the ending, but we speak English today. So there's a reason for that. Uh, they're very different. When you look at the very first colony founded in North America, you have Virginia. Uh, Virginia is a is a venture in capitalism. It's a commercial venture. It's about finding silver and gold at all costs. And as you probably know, there is no silver and gold in Virginia. And people end up actually eating boots and shoes that they boil in Jamestown as a result of the fact that they didn't grow food, they searched for gold and silver. So what I'm saying is Virginia, Maryland, these are major commercial ventures. But then you go north to New England and you see the founding of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. These are religious experiments. People in Virginia, even though they speak the same language, would not say they were like people in Massachusetts. No way. Uh, they would say those people are religious fanatics. And they would say people in Virginia are godless peoples uh, who worship the almighty uh, prophet. Uh, the dollar, that is to say. Uh, so there's these big differences in colonies. Go to the Carolinas and Georgia. Uh, you start to see uh, large-scale plantation agriculture, but not so much in tobacco like we'd see in Virginia. In other goods that are very labor-intensive, like, uh, like cotton uh, specifically, uh, like indigo, things that you need to constantly be harvesting. So large-scale slavery occurs there. Uh, places like where we are in Pennsylvania, in New York, New Jersey, Delaware, the middle colonies, uh, you get some of both sides. You get some of the religious side, you get some of the commercial side. Large-scale farming like you see in the South never happens here. So one of the things you'll see when you study specifically the British experience in the 18th century, in the lead up to the war that's going to make this creek behind us very important. You're going to see a lot of uh, intercolonial squabbling. You're going to see a lot of colonies sort of taking verbal shots at one another. Uh, you're going to see colonies complaining that some do more than others. Even in the military ranks, you're going to see squabbling amongst uh, the provincial troops that are from America and the regular troops that are from Great Britain. You're going to see those divides. So we don't want to make this time period seem like it's all one thing versus all another. Because hopefully by today, at the end of this, you're, you're going to see it's a very complicated affair, which is, which is why I think it's so compelling. But Pennsylvania specifically, I think, uh, and Virginia are going to play very largely and loom very largely into this discussion today. Because these are two colonies that, although they uh, are very close, are worlds apart in the role they play in North America and specifically the role they play here. Uh, Pennsylvania in the 1750s, and I go into this in my new book, uh, which was mentioned, uh, War in the Peaceable Kingdom, it's about the Catanning Raid, had very special circumstances in the way that, as a colony, it was governed, 
that other colonies like Virginia did not. Pennsylvania was what they called a proprietary colony or a proprietary venture. That meant that the Penn family was effectively in control. Virginia was a royal colony. Uh, the empire had more direct control over that. Uh, so because of that, Virginia has a lot of money. They have a, a robust military infrastructure. They are well positioned to be the empire's go-to colony for any potential war in the future. Pennsylvania at the same time in the 1750s is dominated in the assembly by Quakers who are pacifists. They don't even have a standing army. They don't believe in it. Uh, so that's a big problem. Again, we're in Pennsylvania now, uh, but when you look at the French Creek, the Ohio River Valley, there's a very real sense in the 1750s that Virginia wants this area. They want to claim this as their own. And they're the only ones in a position to actually send troops to combat the French and keep them away. Uh, Pennsylvania, again, doesn't even have a standing army. It has to do with the differences between the colonies and the differences uh, in and of themselves as we, uh, as we talk about it. Uh, there's a lot of, I think, today's issues that we think are new that have been around for a long time. And I think the lead up to the events that happen here, especially in the English world, uh, are very telling. Uh, Pennsylvania especially has a pretty unique policy. Pennsylvania has a policy, at least as William Penn envisioned it, of having real true religious freedom uh, when you come here. We always like to say the Puritans brought religious freedom with them uh, when they came to the New World. We learned that. Uh, and you might believe it until you go there and you see pretty quickly that's not the case. There's lots of religious freedom in New England uh, if you are a Puritan. If you're anything but that, uh, if you're Presbyterian, uh, God forbid a Catholic at the time, uh, there is no place for you in that world. You have to go somewhere else. So Pennsylvania is the first colony that, along with New Jersey and ultimately New York to a degree, uh, that really offers religious autonomy. And because of that, you have a wide variety of people who come here, specifically from Central Europe. A lot of Germans, a lot of Swiss. And when they come here, especially the Germans, they don't necessarily adjust their lifestyle uh, to the people who are already here. John Adams will write that he has a very real fear that uh, entire generations of, of German immigrants will never learn the English language and never worship in the English way and never effectively assimilate into the English culture. That sounds familiar, right? Uh, Benjamin Franklin, who we think of being very sort of open-minded, uh, early on is not. He writes about the fact that Germans are taking over the colony. Uh, he says he worries that in our schools, English children will be outnumbered by the Germans and have to speak German. It's a very real fear. If he had to have a telephone and press one for English, two for German, he'd probably be upset about that. Right? Uh, so again, these are not new issues. I think these are like essential American issues, but they're big issues here as well. Pennsylvania has no standing army. Most of the Germans obviously are not Quakers, but they do have a pacifist uh, streak in their communities that makes them very hostile to the notion of a standing army. Pennsylvania is a mess, is what I'm saying. They're not in a position militarily to really defend the frontier against French incursion. They're not. Certainly not Indian incursion. Uh, my new book on the Catanning Raid is really Pennsylvania's first attempt at showing real military strength as a colony. But Virginia is. And that's why moving forward today, when we talk about the events that happen here, it's all Virginia, Virginia, Virginia. I want you to understand there's a reason Pennsylvania wasn't really as involved in that. Um, it's a lot more complicated in colonial America than we tend to think. But this is going to begin with, uh, in a lot of ways, a conflict of interest. Normally when I give this lecture, I have to tell the French side and the Indian side uh, and the... And the and the British side, right? Um, uh, but, you know, we have different speakers for that. So we can just focus on, on Britain, which uh, hopefully makes sense in, in context. Um, this area, if you would have asked somebody in Quebec or Trois-Rivières or Montreal, would have been France. You are in France. At least that's what they, they want you to think. Um, and the British weren't happy about that, especially in Virginia. The governor of Virginia is a man named Robert Dinwiddie. 
He's rich, he's powerful, and again, he makes the major decisions of the colony uh, for the colony. But Robert Dinwiddie has a lot more to lose in the 18th century than just political capital. He has his actual capital invested in this region as well. He's part of a sort of cabal of investors, land investors, called the Ohio Company of Virginia. Uh, and he's got a lot of money tied up in the area in which we live. He wants to buy this land for cheap and he wants to sell it at a major profit and become super rich. And is it a conflict of interest that he's also the governor of Virginia? You bet. Again, these problems haven't gone away, right? There's a lot of uh, backroom deals that still dominate American politics. Uh, but he's got major money tied up in this area. So do his business associates, one of which is a man named Lawrence Washington, uh, the older half-brother of a man who's going to be very important named George Washington. Uh, when the French begin moving into this area, and as I mentioned, constructing forts, making their presence more known in 1753 and 54, uh, these uh, wealthy Virginians who are also in positions of power uh, see their initial investment at risk. If the French do take this land, uh, they lose out on a lot of money. Uh, so yes, it's a conflict of interest. Yes, it's always there. I think it's different than the colonial America we tend to think of. But these are the forces that will drive this war. Uh, Karl von Clausewitz said in a roundabout way, uh, war is merely politics by another means. And this is very much the case that we see here. So in 1753 and 1754, the French out of Canada will initiate a major program of construction and military infrastructure, building roads and forts in this area. And again, they'll build Fort Presque Isle uh, in what is today Erie and Fort Le Bouffe uh, in what is Waterford. Uh, they'll send 2,600 men, as I've mentioned, doesn't sound like a lot, but when your population is less than 60,000, 20, five or 2,600 men is about four and a half to five percent of your population. That's the equivalent of us putting the entire state of Florida in Afghanistan. We're not going to just leave that behind. That's a major investment. And these forts uh, are the major, I think, escalation that occurs that will necessitate a, a further uh, response from the British that will lead to the Seven Years' War. But in the middle of that entire infrastructure project uh, is this creek, the French Creek. I want you to think about this area as people in the 18th century thought about it. If you have school children at home, grandchildren at home, and you hold up a map of the United States, just the outline of this country, and you ask them, what are you looking at? They can probably tell you that's the United States. If you held up an outline of the borders of Pennsylvania, they could tell you that's my state. That's Pennsylvania. But remember, that requires or necessitates an aerial view of things from airplanes. Uh, people didn't have that in the 18th century. Uh, they weren't able to view the land from a bird's eye like we can. What they saw was a lot of very dangerous, very uh, treacherous forests, mountains, uh, and they saw an area they didn't want to travel through. So they looked for the natural superhighways that Mother Nature gave them. And of course, those are rivers, lakes, and streams. Rivers, lakes, and streams become paramount to this story. And again, if you can understand that they never saw this world from above like we can, they had no spatial sense of it from that uh, perspective, um, it's a pretty impressive story. If you ever read George Washington's uh, journal, he was a surveyor before he was uh, on the 1753 mission that went right through here. Christopher Gist, his aide, they write these mileage levels. Washington actually draws a map of the Ohio River, the Allegheny River, French Creek. And the map is sort of laughable by today's standards, but if you can imagine, he's never seen the world the way we see it from above. It's pretty darn impressive. And I think it speaks to our abilities uh, as human beings, what we can do without the aid of technology. Uh, but these were very real skills back then. But in 1753, uh, Robert Dinwiddie is given the authority on behalf of the king as a man who's invested politically and commercially in this region to send an expedition northward. Uh, that's the topic of my first book, uh, Washington's 1753 mission, to ask the French politely to leave, which of course, given the investment they made, they will do. And it really sort of puts French Creek, among other waterways, 
center stage for some of the first times in, in history, uh, in European history, that is. Uh, but I think it's a very real cultural treasure we have, not to get too far ahead. We don't want to talk too much about the Seven Years' War. That being said, I can answer any question you have. Right, so. <laughs> wink, wink. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead of that, but it, it does sort of show why this waterway is so important. And if we can just imagine, you know, this waterway hasn't changed much in 250 years. Imagine French troops uh, sailing down this river, uh, Indian forces encamped along this river, British traders moving through here. It's actually, I think, pretty remarkable. Um, and it's, it really makes it a privilege to, to be here today, but also to call this place home. So uh, thank you. Okay, like I said, you know, I was, I, you know, questions are fair game. So whatever we have, this is always the best part. Uh, yes, ma'am. On page 34, you talk about the audacity of the French claiming the Ohio Valley. But that's not, how do we reconcile this with established settlements, established domestic policy, fortifications, the six places claiming it for his majesty? We have a little problem with subjects here. I'm teasing you a little mm -hmm. but I'm just making the point. There's always two sides to this. Right, absolutely. Um, so she's bringing up an interesting point. Uh, for the English, for the French to build it here is, is, is a great offense to them. Uh, and the French have about a decade or so's worth of claim to this region. Um, but uh, yeah, imagine how the people feel who, who live here otherwise, uh, the people who make their homes here. If, I mean, if you would have been here in the 1720s and 30s and 40s, we always talk about it being Indian land. Um, that really means something. It's more than a place on a map for them. Children would have been playing here. Families would have been raised here. People would have born and died here. I, I guess that's, I mean, I study empire. There's a lot of those claims. Uh, who controls what? Uh, I mean, I think it's audacious from a from a macro view for anyone to claim any land as their own when they really have very few people living here. But I think if you understand those economic drives that generate that sort of um, that sort of way of thinking, um, it, at least from my perspective, it, it it makes a lot more sense. I'm not, by the way, anti-French. I, I I, uh, I believe there's a whole untapped set of sources that we haven't considered much or enough uh, in this field involving the French. Uh, we suffer from something I call Americanitis, where we don't say French words or try to learn the French language, and therefore we tend to forget a, and miss out on a lot of these French sources. Um, but that's just my opinion. Uh, good, other questions? Yes, sir. How many people, European people, would have been along French Creek at the time of Washington's trip? Well, I mean, that's that's difficult to discern. The, the investment in Fort Fort Leboeuf and Fort Presque Isle, and what will later become Fort Machaut and Fort Duquesne, you're looking at a total of about 2,600. It's really hard to determine that because this was a really miserable place to be. Uh, people are dying all the time from disease, malnutrition. I don't know if you guys have spent many winters up here. Uh, yeah, but it's not comfortable in a, in a 21st century home, yet alone you know, a ramshackle hut, essentially, not to offend our, our French friends, uh, that they build here. I mean, it's a pretty nasty place. Commanding officers die regularly. So you have like, I guess the easy way to answer this, it depends when you're asking. You have constant influx of coming and goings between people, so it makes it really hard, but you're not talking about a full-fledged occupation. You're talking about small kind of subsistence levels of people, I would say. Uh, again, the sort of ludicrous to claim the entire Ohio River Valley for theirs, uh, but, you know, Sailor Ronda Blanville places these lead plates, so that's good enough for him, I guess. Uh, but you're, you're, you're dealing with different people at different levels throughout, throughout the war, I would say. But never, never more than, you know, 26, 2700 is usually the, the number will float around. And, and sir, uh, mm -hmm. Paul, you said yeah. that was basically the military's excursion. Would there have been civilians with that? 
you always have some civilians in, in a position like that. In this case, specifically, it, the number was very low. Um, the commandant of some of these early forts and expeditions, you know, did write that his wife was not pleased because he would be gone for uh, at least two years. I mean, you're not going to, if you can avoid bringing non-combatants or civilians into a situation like that, you certainly, uh, you certainly would. But it, again, I'm sure there were, there were some. There's not a lot. Okay, another question. Yes, sir. Can you give us a feel for the number of uh, traders, English or French, who were working this area, let's say, in 20 years before the French and Indian War, or, you know, even going back before so long? Uh, yeah, okay, so the question is how many people were trading here? That's another one of those difficult ones that fluctuates. Um, but these are small operations. These are, if you look at maps from the time period or sources from the time period, there are specific people at specific posts that will always be there, uh, sort of as benchmark places. But you always have new, ambitious, entrepreneurial types from Canada and 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 from the uh, British colonies, traveling throughout, circulating throughout native villages. Um, so these are these are the sort of things that are extremely difficult to nail down. You know, if this was European and European trade, you would have something like a receipt, uh, a ledger. But because a lot of these trades are occurring with native communities uh, in terms of writing things down record keeping it's very one-sided and a lot of these people are looking for quick turnaround so it's I, I would I would be unable to put a figure on it that I would say is accurate uh, but you're again you're talking about small pockets of people who are pretty well known uh, at least with the, the permanent operations uh, it, numerically it's it's hard to quantify that from at least from my perspective good other questions Sir. You said the Ohio Company had a large investment in Western Pennsylvania and Ohio. Mm -hmm. What exactly did that entail? In terms of the landscape? Uh, Money-wise. Oh, boy. Well, it's more money that... It's more, I guess, potential money than actual investment. Uh, they are sort of divvying this land up amongst themselves and... You can't really put a price on it. Uh, you know, price is what you pay, value is what you get, that sort of thing. So the money they would have made here, if you can imagine, you know, a soldier that fought at, for example, Fort Necessity. We were just at Fort Necessity filming uh, an episode of my series, Battlefield, Pennsylvania. Uh, and David Preston, who's here, he was one of our, one of our guests. Um, we were discussing why these people who were effectively, you know, homeless homeless people, for lack of a better term, that fought with Washington in 1754, they were promised 60 acres of land just for their service. So they would literally go from being destitute to having 60 acres, and that was like a pitiance. So you're talking about massive, massive land holdings here. Uh, and again, this is land that still isn't totally developed. I always want to stress this. I love driving through West Virginia. I think West Virginia is one of the most beautiful states in our country. Um, you know, George Washington sailed down the Ohio River and he was speculating land there. And to look at it, a lot of that land still isn't developed. There's still not, a, there's, there's not homes. You know, it's, it's owned by lumber companies effectively, but it's, it's, it's still blank a canvas in a lot of ways. You saw what he would have seen. Um, it's it's un, uncalculable how much there was. I heard, a, this was an aside, but I heard a statistic that said that if you took a, an enormous iron and you flattened out West Virginia, like push the mountains down, the land size would be three times the size of the United States today. Because <laughs> it's all, it's all mountain. That's, that's from what they tell me. I mean, I don't know if you can test that, but they say that's a true story, Lancer. But that's an enormous, I mean, you can't calculate the, what was at stake. So when the Ohio company sees the French moving in, it's not so much what the investment they, that they've initially lost. It's, it's the future investment that they could have gained from it. And even in this era, you have a lot of this land were depreciation lands and, and donation lands to revolutionary soldiers. I mean, what we consider to be big pieces of land for, for relatively little. Mm -hmm. The French got let place by the English. They just went to cut the big uh, notch on the tree the Yeah, those lead plates loom large. The French believe that putting lead plates at, at key junctions of waterways uh, gave them legitimacy. And I think a lot of that's because, as you said, the English didn't really do that. Uh, they had it on paper somewhere. They had intentions. 
Uh, they were big on charters. You know, Virginia's colonial charter is my favorite. Virginia controls everything from sea to sea. Well, great. You know, uh, you're on our land now. You know, um, but that's that's a very and again, it's it's why these yes, they're European, but it's such a different perspective on what an empire is and how you manage an empire. The British and French were very far apart on that, and I think that's one of the important keys. Uh, the English didn't have that that permanent sort of uh, physical construction on land that, that they claim to it. And the French put a great stock in that, as we mentioned, with the forts they built. Good, other questions? Question ah, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, trying to unlearn some of the history I grew up with. OK. It's now when I was a kid. <laughs> uh, I was given to the notion that Great Britain, indeed, as you said, they didn't have the birds I perspective demarcated territories, areas that belong to him. And what I I think I may have been uh, miseducated in was that all well, the French just come over here and said, trade, 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 make friends with the Indians, make money, we give you forts. But they didn't have little regions. Is that correct or do I need to unlearn that? Well, um, here's here's how I could answer that. I think the French and the English had totally different conceptions of what an empire was and how you how you controlled it. For the French, again, as I said at the beginning, they had, re had people reach the Rocky Mountains before the British ever reached the Appalachians, but the French only did that because they would travel down waterways very far and very fast. And they viewed North America like almost like a circulatory system. The heart is in the St. Lawrence River Valley at Quebec and also in Louisiana at a place like New Orleans. And the way you connected those uh, was through waterways. They, they sort of envisioned it, if you can get there quickly, which again, waterways are the easiest way, you can unify an empire basically the size of Paris to Moscow. Uh, and they, they wanted to do that again, using the St. Lawrence River, using the Great Lakes, using French Creek to the Allegheny, Allegheny to the Ohio, the Ohio to the Mississippi, and there's your empire. So for the, for the French, a lot of it was how far could they travel, how fast, and trade was a way to keep alliances with Indians. Uh, but as, as, as David uh, Preston it, it will explain later, containing the British was also part of that. The British grew very slowly. You know, the Atlantic colonies, we know them. They grew from the Atlantic coast to the Appalachians, but they cleared the land as they did it. So for them, every inch of land they plowed was land that was theirs to keep. So they grew very slowly, but also way more permanently. Again, a million and a half people can live on clear land. The French, only 55,000, sort of had that circulatory system view. And if you ever cut that, that river circuit off, then the empire severed, which makes it very fragile. Uh, so that's what, I, that's what I would say. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily uh, competing in the same way. They were competing for the same space, but they viewed the control very differently. For the, for the French, though, if they could just view a map only of waterways, that would have been a sufficient map for them. And if you look at their forts, they're all at significant water junctions because they never really had an intention of expanding beyond the waterways themselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, question over here? Yes. Yeah. After the French and Indian War, did Virginia try to claim most of the of our country? Yeah. Yeah, I, in my book, Fort Pitt, I have four copies left. Uh, there's an entire chapter on a pseudo-civil war that develops between Pennsylvania and Virginia over Pittsburgh itself. Uh, the, the, the primary focus point of occupation for the British after the Seven Years' War was Fort Pitt. And Fort Pitt and Pittsburgh that surrounded it was largely uh, populated by Virginians. They came up what is essentially the old Braddock Road from Virginia and they funneled in. Pennsylvanians were also moving into the Ohio country, but they were coming in via the Forbes Road. And Hannestown was kind of their place. So because you had these ambiguous borders, the governor of Virginia, uh, John Murray, the fourth Earl of Dunmore, decided he would take the initiative. He had the money, he had the capital, and no one would stop him. He made the Western Pennsylvania effectively uh, part of Virginia. He called it the District of West Augusta. He made three new counties out of it. Uh, Monongalia County, uh, Yokogania County, uh, and the third one was uh, um, 
uh, what, something else. But anyway, he made them administrative districts. And Virginia said, this land is ours, Pennsylvanians are trespassing. So they started arresting prominent Pennsylvanians in Pittsburgh. And then in Hannestown, they started arresting Virginians and locking them up there. So they were both claiming uh, 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 sovereignty over this area. And it looked like it was going to become actually like maybe, maybe blood would be shed. But then the revolution started. That kind of wiped the slate clean. They all realized at that point it was sort of an existential crisis. And that, that put it to rest. But again, this was one of these things where there was no real legitimate claim. And all the way through the Seven Years' War into the Revolutionary Period, Virginia had grand designs that this area would be theirs. And we talked about the investment. So uh, that's a whole chapter in my book on Fort Pitt. It's really sort of humorous, but also very scary uh, how close they came to, to shedding blood at some points. Good. Yeah. Uh, can you speak a minute? Um, for example, I know Proclamation 1763, right after the French and Indian War. Mm -hmm. um, it disallowed the British from settling, really clearing the land past the Appalachian Mountains. So how did the Native Americans kind of see the drink of the French that allowed them to build the force in this valley at that time when the French were building? Okay, so the proclamation line of 1763 is the, is the end of the war. It's whenever the French are neutralized, Britain will control the land that's set. Um, and this is sort of a guarantee to the Indian peoples. It's also a mechanism of control. When the French initially come here, you really don't have strong alliances yet with the native peoples that are here. Uh, and it basically comes down to France's great argument to the, to the Shawnee and the Delaware and the Mingo that live here. Uh, their great sort of argument is a war may be coming. Um, if the English win, they're going to stay here. If we win, we'll trade, but we'll never, we'll never populate this area. And especially like the book I just finished on Katanning, the, 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 the chief... Uh, like men like Shingus and Katanning, that was the selling point. You know, you have to make a choice who you'll side with in this war. One will probably take your land and keep it. One will come and go. And that was that was as simple as it sounds. That was basically the uh, root cause of that. It was I don't want to say the lesser of two evils because there was an alliance there, but uh, it was really what they planned on doing with the land once they won it. That's what I would say. There's more to it, but I think that's the that's the heart of it. Good. Yes. Yeah, that's an interesting, again, I study empire as a theme. That's an interesting mechanism of empire. You have a place that you want to keep, you want to make it yours, but nobody wants to live there, so you force people to live there. Uh, that was pretty common in the English world over a period of 100 years or so. There wasn't much of that in the French world. Again, the French had so few people. The ones that were here really could make a, a pretty good go making money, uh, but it was so hard to do, very few people wanted to do it. But again, the French never looked at a big population as key to their empire. For the English, they cleared land and they held it. So you need people to live there. But for the French, it wasn't necessarily about how much land you could keep as far as how much influence you could spread. Uh, more people would help that. I, I don't know that there's, I'm sure there's some, but I don't know there's much in terms of imperial policy forcing undesirables to come here. Like in England, they literally found orphan children prostitutes, debtors that were filling up jails, and they put them on a boat and they sent them places and said, you're going to live here or else. You know, they did that a lot in Georgia. They didn't even put them in prisons because, like, you can go into the swamp and be eaten by alligators or you can just live here and start making a way of life and speak English. And so there was a lot of that. For France, I didn't, I'm not familiar with a lot of it, though. It was just a different view of an empire. Good, anything else? Yes, ma'am. Spoke about our weather before. Yeah. Why did Washington undertake that Okay, it's not so much about what's going on right then, but it's it's future potential. So he'll set out in in the late summer. By the time he really gets up here, you're you're dealing with November, December. He'll return in January, and that was because this is an era of what we call gesture politics. And a good example of gesture politics is like the Boston Tea Party. 
Yes, it was massive destruction of private property, but it was done to make a statement. The people who were involved in the Boston Tea Party were very clear. You know, someone broke a lock, they made them replace it. Someone tried to steal the tea, they stripped them naked, and made them walk home. They say, we're doing this for a specific purpose, to send a message, it's a gesture. And that was part of that too. The British honestly didn't believe the French were gonna leave whenever George Washington, who was nobody, asked them to do it. But they made the gesture knowing that whenever he got back, it would be springtime, and springtime is when you wanna launch a military campaign. You don't wanna launch a campaign in the dead of winter, that's not good for anybody. So the idea was he can get there and get back, and plans were already in motion when the spring thaw hit that they would be back in force with people. So Washington, again, had a pretty easy mission, walk through the snow, whatever, it was just so he was back in time to launch that spring attack, which was a foregone conclusion, I think, at that point. Good. Uh, anything else? Yes, sir. How did Pennsylvania end up with uh, Western Pennsylvania? Um, you start to get into uh, border disputes after the revolution with that um, the establishment of the Mason-Dixon line, things like this sort of solidify that. Off the top of my head, I'm not... I'm not particularly sure with with that but the shape of the state does come down to different conflicts at times Connecticut has a major claim to parts of the northern tier of the state parts of Ohio the Western Reserve of Ohio they called it uh, the notion of the borders we have now are pretty fluid that's you could easily find that but that's sort of out of my uh, out of my purview so I'm sure someone here knows that <laughs> yeah Speak to who Washington had with him, how many people, whether he was on horseback, was he consistent from Virginia up to here? Yeah. He had, he had a, a pretty big party with him. He had uh, four Indian chiefs, we know who they are. He had Christopher Gist, who was, you know, always gets, I think, portrayed as like a rough, roughneck type frontiersman type, but Gist came from a wealthy family in Maryland. He had a lot of money tied up, or potential money tied up here. Gist had a team with him of people he knew and trusted well. Uh, they were pretty pretty good survivalist frontiersmen. They were basically there to make sure Washington, in my opinion, got back. Washington spoke no French. To my knowledge, he had not really even seen an Indian before that mission. These people did. Um, they knew how to survive in the Ohio country. They were acclimated to the climate. So with uh, Washington, his interpreter, Gist, his men, you're looking at uh, probably just shy of, or maybe just over a dozen people or so with him. Um, again, names off the top of my head. It's, it's been a while, but they were mostly there as a team for diplomatic and practical purposes. Uh, whenever they got to Fort LeBeouf, Washington and Gist did go back south alone by themselves. They believed they could move more quickly. Washington had the golden goose. He had that letter from the French commandant saying that he did not feel obliged to uh, to uh, leave the area. So they wanted to get that to Williamsburg as quickly as possible. Washington on horseback on the way up, but on foot on the way down, believed that he and Gist could get there faster by themselves. Mm -hmm. I John Granger had a uh, train with Right. I mean, it's it's at it's at Venango. If you are a, a trader, if you're a, you know you want to trade with Indians, it makes sense to establish yourself at or near an Indian village. Uh, and Venango was an important one because it was on the river, but it was a real cross section of the Indian world. I mean, today we use words like white and Indian, but that wasn't really used at that point. Certainly not in the Indian world. You would have tribal nations of all peoples traveling through Venango. So if you're a person like Fraser, you want to be where the action is. So you put your trading post there. And the French, when they first got to Venango, made sure to run him out first and foremost because he was the real English presence in the region for as minimal as he was. Mm -hmm. uh, the French Creek and Allegheny were uh, travel paths to the travel route, but there was also a, a trail, uh, trading yeah. that went through and, uh, Frank. Yeah. So, that's so and, and, the, and these are major crossroads. Paul Wallace has the standard book on this, The Indian Trails of Pennsylvania. It's been incredibly valuable as a source, but you can see Pennsylvania had a vast network of Indian trails. Uh, and you can kind of put your finger on where they come together and guess there's probably some kind of trading post or village at that point. Okay, good. Anything else? Yes, sir. 
in eastern Crawford County, there's a cemetery. Mm -hmm. And they claim that an individual from Washington's party is buried in this cemetery, which is somewhat ludicrous in the sense that we're on cemetery. And there's no record of a man dying in either Correct. Gist or Washington's diary, which would have been a significant event. They would have recorded that. Absolutely. Where did that, that story come from? I mean, it, it makes no sense. But yet, they have signs posted. And um, okay, so it could be, I'm not familiar with it, first. But it could be one of two things. If there is a person there, which I don't have a record of, maybe it was... Later in life, they came and were buried. I doubt that. When I'm, <clears throat> let me let me tell you the story. When I was in graduate school, uh, my job, in exchange for free tuition, was to, uh, for two hundred fifty dollars a month, uh, run the old stone house museum at Slippery Rock. That's what I did, and it was a lot of like picking up dead ladybugs and you know getting school groups through. But people would always ask, "Didn't George Washington sleep here?" Which is crazy. He did go through that area, but there was nothing there. And like right around 1876, the centennial becomes very popular in this country to say George Washington slept here. So I think that's probably wh where that starts. Because if you can say that, then people will come and spend money, and that's what you want. The point is, though, that I mean that legend, which is obviously myth, was taken by Wallace, and he put it into one of his books, yeah. which gave it legitimacy. Right, so that's one of those. That's one of those things that's important. You know, if you want to start writing history books and getting into history books in this field, the classic standard works of the French and Indian War are 50 years old, maybe from the 1920s, and they're filled with things that are unsubstantiated local legends. Um, it, you know, it's just it's it's amazing. You know, David Preston's book on on Braddock's defeat, which I highly recommend is now the benchmark standard on that event. And the one before that was from the 60s or 70s. I mean, look at how many books we've had published on Gettysburg in the last five years. And you have all, almost 50 years between this book and the previous standard on the work. So if you're going to write on the topic in this field, you know, one, go to the sources, but two, it's probably the best thing that's gonna be written on it. You know, the books I used on Gaia Suda talked about red men and savages and all of these things. Like, that's not, it doesn't sound very unbiased to me. <laughs> you know? And I now it was all, you know, words are words, but that's part of what you have is you know, I'm sure there's still a lot of local legends that may prove to be true. Um, I talked at length about where Gaia Suda is buried. You know, we'll probably never know. Uh, but that's how you do get these things enshrined in our memory from, you know, people who do write them and include them in the books. Again, that's one of those things you have to take, you know, be skeptical, but try to find the source if you can. Okay, so I'm going to be under the tent. If you want to tell me about your research or come over and just shoot the breeze or buy books or anything, come on over. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here today.